I think everybody seems to be ready to wait for the second hour of the day lecture. So let me introduce our passionate, dedicated lecturer. Yes. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'm actually, you know, I, I think I'm pretty close to the end of where I want to be at this. Um, so I've just ruled out roll up movements, right? Which my, and roll up movement is being ruled out here, not just in the weird, strange cases where we see roll up movement being used in analyses of, of agglutination or whatever, right? But it's actually even a bit more radical than that. So this system actually will rule out VP topicalization in English as a movement operation, right? So, uh, Let's say something like, um, example in here. So if you have, yeah, look at 55 in the um, handout page 9. Okay. So here's the, uh, the example. And eat the mouse, Lily certainly will. Okay? Classic example of VP topicalization in English. But of course, that will have the tree, like you see in 56 there. Right? And that tree will take V star P and move it to some higher position, say for example to specify some focus projection, or whatever the analysis of that is. Okay? And that, of course, is just a configuration like this. Right? That is, we've got V down here, we build up to some point here, it's like V star, build up some more, this is focus, and then we've raised this up to here. So we can't do that in this system. Which might worry me. However, it turns out that there's a fairly straightforward solution to this, which actually has some very nice effects. And the solution is to say, okay, well, so far we've decided that, that we've got these universal extent projections, uh, and what and what this, these things here, the very lowest ones do, is that they can label the roots, right? So cat can be a noun. Cat can be an adjective, run can be a verb. Okay? But that's just a stipulation of, oh, it's not even a stipulation, it's just something we've assumed, right? But there's no reason to say that, for example, we couldn't have, have uh, higher level categories in here labeling things in here. Okay? So this maybe goes back a bit to Professor Moon's question about what can be a functional category and can they be inside the root lexicon, okay? and I said no, and I still mean no, because I don't think there are functional categories inside the root lexicon, but I do think that we can have verbs, which are like light verbs or auxiliaries, as roots. Okay? That is, we can take something like, uh, like um, will in English, we can say that that is root, Right? But it's not a verb, it's a modal. Right? And what we've essentially done there is we've said that what, one of the things that English can do in its lambda, big lambda, is when it's building this thing out of these universal extended projections, it can say, okay, well actually in English, modal is not, modal is, is a, a category here that can label one of these root elements. It might not be in a language with, say, just affix or modals, right? In a language like English, which has verbal modals, that verb is a root, and it can have a category. It's not got the category V, it's got the category modal, in this case. And then the rest of the extended objection will just continue, as it would normally continue. Modal, T, C, focus, whatever. Okay? Because we're still going up in the extended objection at this point. So now we've got a rooted extended projection here that uh, is rooted by will, but it has no thematic information in it at all. So I guess this is actually maybe the fourth way of thinking about functional morphemes, right? If you think of an auxiliary verb as a functional morpheme, right, you can say there's a, a root labeled by a high level category in 
uh, u e p. Right? So rather than labeling the root with v or n or a, we label it with something higher, okay? Which means that you can only go up in that extent of projection. Okay, so if we allow those kinds of things, and I think we want to allow those kinds of things actually in general, if we allow those kinds of things, then we can have an analysis of VP fronting that looks as follows. We say we've got will, or whatever it is literally we've got, so this is a way to do support as well. Will is a modal. And then here's the crucial bit that we need to do to, uh, to make the auxiliary system work in English. We say that V star P, and actually it's maybe not really V star P, it's probably something participial rather than V star P. I've written it as V star in 57 for kind of simplicity's sake, but it's probably a piece of, here's an interesting thing, it might not even be part of the verbal extent of injection. Might be an adjectivalization of that extended projection. But those are sort of intricate questions of analysis, they're not really crucial here. Let's just say it's a V star P we built up here. And what was the example? The example was uh, eat mass. Okay? And then we're going to recurse at this level. I don't know whether this is also true, maybe this actually requires another functional category. Again, detailed questions of analysis. For simplicity, we'll just recurse it, because we can. Okay? And then we continue on here, we go up to T. Oh, we've got the trace of Lillian here. So Lillian here, because that's the set of V star, right? We'll move back up to here. Okay. So this is movement of uh, um, Lillian. Into this position. So I'm not going to be really at remnant movement, I'm going to be really like roll up movement. Okay. And then we continue up to C, and then it its focus. And now what we do is we take this thing here and we move it into the specifier of focus phase. So now what we've got is two rooted extended projections, not one. Right? So this one is rooted by will. Right? And it's got modal in it up to T and it doesn't have V star P in it. This one is rooted by eat and it only goes up to V star P. They're, in, they're different roots of extended projections. Okay? So now if we apply our definitions, we can allow this one to be the specifier and this one to be the complement. Right? Because this one is rooted with will and this one is rooted with a different extended projection. It's rooted with eat. Okay. So what, we essentially, what we're essentially doing is base generating these v, v star p things as a specifier of an auxiliary, and then moving it. Now, the structure looks almost identical to the structure that we that we would use when we move things, right? Right. So rather than saying we've got will, which is the modal with a vp v star p here, and then is there, and then that goes up to here, where they're all part of the same extent of projection, which we ruled out, right? We have two separate ones. The nice thing about this story is, it kind of forces us to have an auxiliary in this system, right? So what's ruled out, imagine we don't have an auxiliary here. In the standard system, that looks exactly the same. Auxiliary, no auxiliary, makes no difference and we just move this thing up to here. But actually, we know in almost all the cases, in fact, all the cases I can think of that have well-established analyses, it turns out that VP movement requires an auxiliary. Right? So think of all the cases in German, or in French, or in English, I don't know what happens in Korean. I'm not worried about this. But, like, uh, but in general, when you have VP movement, you get an auxiliary out of this. Right? My system predicts you need an auxiliary, right? There's no way for me to, to just move the VSRP up to some focus projection. I don't know of any other analysis of VP fronting that predicts you need to have an auxiliary, but this one does. So I think that that's a plus point for the system rather than a minus point, right? Because what you end up doing is saying, roll up movement in general is ruled out, 
But there's a way to get around that, right? Because it's ruled out, it's ruled out because you're breaking up a single extended projection. There's a way to get around that, have two extended projections, then you're not breaking up a single one. Okay? And that's what my system will end up doing. And this particular configuration, where we have uh, some kind of rooted functional element, right, where something that's specified is going to be absolutely crucial for solving the problems I start, I finished off with yesterday, which is the ordering problem and the meaning problem, right, for for object for PP complex lines. So we'll see that in a little bit. Okay, so um, so that's basically how we're going to solve these kinds of uh, roll-up problems. Now, notice there's another prediction about this, which is that in order to get roll-up, hard roll-up, not real roll-up, but in order to get the look of roll-up, right, what we need to do is have a semantically contentful element, because it's got a root in it, right, a semantically contentful element, which is high up in the extended projection. It's the only way to, sort of, this is like a base generated roll-up structure, in effect, right? So the only way to do that is to have a semantically contentful now we know that's exactly the opposite of most roll-up analyses. Most roll-up analyses actually don't have any semantic content to the, to the functional head that causes the roll-up. In fact, that's the whole point of roll-up in a sense, right? So that's why Kane has his little WP, which says, you know, it's a word order phrase. It's to get the word order right. It's nothing to do with the, with the, uh, with the meaning, with the semantics, right? So my system only allows these apparent things that look like, sorry, I shouldn't question that, these apparent things that look like a roll-up configuration when you've got a semantically contentful category, which restricts roll-up massively, actually. Okay. I mean, restricts apparent roll-up massively. There's no real roll-up. Is that clear? No, it wasn't clear. Yeah. Uh, if, you don't, if you don't have a model uh, in that sentence, so what's the derivation? Well, then you have then you have a different thing here, right? Then you have a different root in this case. And actually, a lot of people have argued that the do in do sport cases is really a modal. So Ian Roberts has this quite elegant uh, set of dialectal data from English that show that do is really used. It's, a, it's really a modal. It's, in, it's a modal in that T kind of position. Um, so for me, I have do in this in this position. Uh, and then Ian argues that actually do comes with this effective semantics. And that's why you get it in negation, why you get it in uh, subject auxiliary inversion, uh, and so on. So like, actually this has, I mean, this root here has some real semantics in it. So for do support, I would just do that. It's exactly what I would do. Yeah. Try that I can actually make myself very clear. So I'm thinking of your system. On the one hand, just as you said, you need some like lexical root that presents the verb. You know. then, yep. But on the other hand, you also have these functional categories such as C and T, which do not necessarily have lexical roots. It is no elements, right? Now we are looking at this model. Which is totally different hybrid. Mm -hmm. So what really, you know, what makes you to, you know, what makes you actually <laughs> propose yeah. that the model should be electrically filled, not null? So, so, uh, so, I mean, I, yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, in fact, I don't think lexically filled is crucial, right? I think in English it's crucial because you, because T is actually in English effect. I mean. Whenever you spell out T, you better spell it out the root in English. Right? I mean, that's, that's a condition of the morphology of English. The, the T is, I mean, it's that very old notion from going back to synthetic structures, the T is affixal in English. And even null T is affixal in English, as we can see from verbs like put, right, which can be present or past. And there are varieties uh, where actually, there are varieties of English where actually you can see other effects for example, whether you can do do deletion, depending on whether put is present or past, right? So the nullness of T is sort of irrelevant 
to his affectionality. So I think for English, that's what, that's why you have deuce book in English, because T is fundamentally affective. For other languages, I think maybe have, this could be null, depending upon the phonological conditions of these things, right? English is not. But the bigger question I think you're asking, tell me if this is right, the bigger question I think you're asking is, you know, okay, we've got different ways of doing these functional morphs now. And this one here seems suspicious because it's a root that we're talking about as a functional morph. And I think that that's just that's just because we have an intuition about what functional category versus lexical category means. And we should get rid of that intuition. Right? Because it doesn't really help us. What it does is it creates problems for us. So think about grammaticalization as a phenomenon. So in this system, grammaticalization is very easy. This system grammaticalization says, well, will used to be a V, right? Way back when. I mean, it had all the properties of being a V. And then at some point, we decided to recategorize it as a modal, right? So actually, it just stays where it is in the root lexicon, right? <laughs> and all we do is we say that root label it, that the modal, that, that functional, sorry, it's not functional, but you know, that member of C lex can now label that root. Right. And presumably there was a period of time in English where, where will, for example, and actually all the modals, were both verbs and modals, right? They were so, so if that is my system, they could be labeled either by V or by modal. If they're labeled by V, they have V properties. If they're labeled by modal, they're functional in a sense, right? Like auxiliaries. And then those two, those two kinds of uh, labeling survived together for a while in the language until essentially the V one died off, okay? So that's what happened, and this system makes that very easy. Our traditional notion of functional category versus lexical category makes that kind of grammaticalization, well, it's hard to see what it is, right? I mean, like, it's hard to, I mean, because there is no clear notion about what constitutes a functional versus a lexical category, people get all twisted, all tied up in questions of like, does it really assign a feature role? Is it raising versus control? Is it, you know, all this kind of stuff. But actually, I think it's just, what's its label? Modal? V. So this system gives us a very neat way, actually, of reconceptualizing the distinction between lexical and functional categories. We say there isn't such a distinction, right? There's just different labels for roots. And some labels don't label roots. Some labels are higher up than where the root is. To some labels, label roots, and that's all, that's so that's the I think that was the intuition behind the question. And my answer is that notion of functional lexical category we shouldn't be too hide about our traditional view of it because actually we should think about what the theoretical view would be. And I think that that theoretical view, at least from this perspective, is clearer than the tradition. That probably was a longer answer than you were expecting. But anyway. Okay, so. Um, Alright, we're going to come back a little bit to this, to these funny, these funny structures where we've got a verbal specifier of some kind of, you know, rooted category like this. But before I do that, I'm just going to very quickly, if you want, run through how semantic interpretation works. I don't know if it's necessary because it's blindingly obvious, but just so you can see that it works. Um, so have a look at fifty-eight. 58 is how semantic interpretation works in my system. So it says, in a structure where gamma is the mother of alpha and beta, we've got gamma is the mother of alpha and beta. <coughs> then if beta is the I complement of gamma, so let's say that that's the I complement of that, where the label of gamma is greater than the label of beta, Right? Then the interpretation of gamma, so everyone knows that those funny square brackets mean the interpretation, right? The interpretation of gamma is the interpretation of the label of gamma, right? Applied to the interpretation of beta, applied to the interpretation of alpha, if it exists. So it's a bit of a funny thing, right? Because actually, I should write this slightly differently. So what we're really saying is that the interpretation of gamma of the whole thing, right, is built up out of the interpretation of this label, of the label of this, plus the interpretations 
of these things. Right. So let's have a look at our favorite example then, which is Lily Jumps. So we've seen 59. So 60A says the interpretation of that tree is the interpretation of the label of the tree, which is V star, okay, applied to the interpretation of the complement of V star, which is jump. Right? And then once we build that up, then we then apply to that, that to the interpretation of Lily. Okay? So because we've got, I mean, normally in, in the semantics, we run the semantics off the head. Right? But there isn't a head here, so what we're doing is we're running the semantics of the whole thing off of the semantics of the label. Right? So at each step up, what you do is you go, I've got the interpretation of those two things that have already been built up or they're given directly by you know, the meaning of the root, say. And then what I do is I build, I put them together, I use my syntax to figure out what the label of the thing is that I put together. I use my syntax to figure out what's the complement and what's the specifier. And then I use my semantics to figure out how to put those together, right? So then I say, the semantics of the whole thing is the semantics of the label I just figured out, applied to the semantics of the complement, and that is applied to the semantics of the specimen. Okay? <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. Doing our kind of Kratzerian semantics then, what we get out for 60 is, 60A, right? Is 60B, okay? So the interpretation I've given there for the little v star is just Kratzer's interpretation for little v star, which says, I'm looking for an individual, and I'm looking for an event, and I'm going to say that the individual is the agent of the event. Right? That's all that says. And then we apply that in some appropriate fashion to the interpretation of the verb, which is pi on a jumping event. And that gives you something which you then apply to the individual lily. Okay? So, that little circle I put there is a variable over various modes of semantic composition. So we talked a little bit earlier on in one of the talks about different ways you could put things together in the semantics. So normally we put things together by functional application, right? Which just says something's a feature, sorry, something's a function, something's an argument, stick them together. There are other ways of doing it though. So for example, Kratzer motivates this thing she calls event composition or event identification or which says, you've got two things which are predicates of events, stick them together, like this, one's, this one relates to an individual, that one's an event, stick them together, basically. And there are various other kinds of composition modes, right? <coughs> I'm actually somewhat, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, I'm actually somewhat suspicious about event identification, but um, we'll adopt it just now. So, uh, you can see how this works. If you know semantics, you can see if it works. If you don't know semantics, you can take my word for it. It works. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I mean, to me, the inference is fine, but uh, in terms of the Chu's interpretation, isn't the uh, the uh, interpretation of little v, for example, is too complex for a child to acquire this uh, label or the, the, the interpretation of this label? I don't think so. I mean, I would assume that the meanings of things like little v or D, or whatever, are given to us. Like, we don't learn those, right? Yeah. We might learn which morphine goes with the meaning, right? Or which piece of structure goes with the meaning. But we don't learn that little d star means I relate agents and mm -hmm. events. Right? Those are just part of, part of universal cognition and semantics, right? Yeah, I mean, no. For, for the meaning of V, or V, or N, I think that's fine for the child to acquire, which is uh, all the abstract, but also simple. But for the meaning of little V, because it will have to specify that there is agent, there is event, <coughs> and there is uh, the predicate of the event, which seem to be too complex for a child to acquire. Um, what about kiss? Mm -hmm. That word, kiss. Yeah. Presumably you have to specify that there is a kissing action, and there's something that's being kissed, and there's a relationship between the kissing action and the person that's being kissed. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, the meaning of kiss should be just as difficult to acquire as the meaning of little v. But clearly kids acquire it. So, I, I think that there's not really, I mean, <clears throat> now you're asking a general question about, about event semantics, but I think that you know, there's no reason to assume that 
acquiring some piece of event semantics is any more difficult than anything else. And I would assume that you know the meaning, say, of I don't know, telic aspect. I mean, it's just given by the nature of the semantics of telic aspect, right? So those things are not. I mean, that's pretty complicated. That says find an event, look at its temporal continuity, make sure it's got an endpoint, make sure that endpoint is contiguous with the specifier of aspect, which is some D, so the building, the house means something different from building houses. I mean, those are pretty complex things, but kids don't ever have any problem acquiring them. In fact, they acquire them incredibly simply. And actually, the notion of little v is also acquired. There's good evidence that the notion of cause, at least, right, is acquired incredibly early. In fact, there's some work by Susan Carey, I think. I think it's, hmm. Carey or Spelman, I always get them mixed up. Anyway, work by one of the two of them that shows the causes around something like a, about age four weeks. So it's just about as early as you can get. So I, I think it's not quiet. I think it's better. OK. Um, all right, I'm not going to go through the rest of the semantics. You can see how it works, right? I mean, if you're interested, you can see how it works. It works very straightforwardly. And it's just this traditional mode of semantics, actually. Right? Just apply to this new system. Linearization we talked about. So um, the last thing I want to briefly go through today, do I want to talk about this today? Yeah, um, is um, biphrases. So um, we talked a bit about earlier on about um, little v and how that works, right? What little v does is it introduces an agent through, ident through event identification. But the system I just proposed actually raises a question about another way of deriving agentivity. Right? So imagine we've got, this, this is very old generative semantics kind of way of doing things. But imagine we've got a root, which is something like act. Okay? So this goes back to your question about whether these can be null. Right? So imagine we've got a root, which, is, which you can call something like act. Okay? So little v is not a root. Remember, I mean, little v so far is just part of the, of the extended projection. But imagine we've got act, and we tell, and we say that act is labelable by little v. Okay? So let's, draw, let's run through a derivation of how that might look. So it's going to look a little bit like this, but we're going to have act here. And we're going to see that it doesn't give us an auxiliary, which gives us a biphrase. <coughs> so the idea will be, we say, um, Act is a relationship sort of between an individual and an event, or act is a V star. Now, in the same way, the, uh, we, what we did before was we recursed the modal. We'll recurse the V star, and here's where we're going to put in the actor. Who's, who's doing this? No, it's Lydia. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Okay, so. <coughs> And then what I'm going to do is the same kind of thing I did before, where we put the VP in the specifier of an auxiliary. Now I'm going to put it in an outer specifier of V star. So here's where we're going to get the VP rather than the V star P, right? So what we're going to have is uh, another rooted projection, which is going to be, so she's just jumping, so there's not very much to it, which is just this. So we've got two rooted projections here, one coming here and one coming here. Now, in the little handout, I've given you a derivation of that in the syntax of how the rootedness works, and I've given you a derivation of that in the semantics of how that works, but it doesn't really matter. Okay. I mean, it matters, but you know, I've, I've been through this enough times that I'm, I'm pretty sure that you're fairly happy with it. <coughs> okay, so then the idea will be that once we build this up, actually, this bit here, or you might think of it as this bit here, we'll come back to that later on, is going to be spelled spell outable as PP by the way. So this would be something like, it was jumped by Lily, which we can't say in English, but we can say in Dutch. Okay? So, this is, so, so the idea would be that there's two ways of getting agents into the syntax. One way is by using little v as part of the extended projection of big V, right? in which case, we get just what we're used to, and we use event identification. Another way will be by using the same technique that we used before with models, 
We will do it instead with some kind of something else, some kind of general group. And what we then can do is we can say that if we look at this semantically, what this will do is this will say up here we basically get Lily is an agent of some event, and then what we do is we say that event is an event of Jockey. So by here, we actually get more or less the same semantics as we got for Lily jumped. So we get, it was jumped by Lily, and Lily jumped, both being two, being two different ways of introducing agents into the verb structure. Okay? Now, obviously, this isn't true for English. Right? English doesn't have this as a standard, right? So it doesn't have this with, with intransitive. Yeah? Isn't that the is that what? Complement relationship, the job and the act. In what sense is that complement? No, two different groups of extended projections, right? So in this case, we can add a root of extended projection into this. This will be a complement of that. That will be a complement of that, actually. Right? We have a different root of extended projection going through this one, so we're like this to be a specifier. There is a general question. Right? Yeah, exactly. So and then the lady and the jump open down the specifier? These are both specifiers. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. So I mean I'm not proposing this for English because well not, well, not for English in transitives anyway. But you can see exactly how we can how we might build this up into uh, um, in in so not this for English, but something like this for passive by in English, right? So rather than act here, I don't really know what the verb will be, but it'll, its root will be B. Okay. And then we have a single extended projection going up here, where we've got T up here. Oh, and obviously we're not going to have jump here, right? Because we because oh. have a look at the tree, it's easier to see. So have a look at the tree in uh, 75. Okay? So in, or 76 rather. So in 75, we've got Lily was bit by Anson. So people know Collins' smuggling analysis of these passives, right? So Collins' smuggling analysis is a roll-up movement analysis of passives. Okay. So remember, I can't do roll-up movement, right? So what do I do instead? So have a look at, the, at first of all, 76, which is Collins' analysis. He says that really low down, what we've got is the little VP with Anson uh, taking Anson being the subject of little V, okay, and there being a participial phrase which is the complement of little V. Then he puts the by phrase in in a head called voice. He raises the participle past it, and then he raises the object at it. Right? So that's what you see in 76. Are people familiar with this analysis or do you want me to go through it with Borrow? Who has never seen this analysis before? Everyone's seen it, right? <laughs> yeah? Okay, alright. Okay, so 76 is, is Collins' of smuggling analysis. Now, my analysis, I can't do this, right? I mean, Collins' of smuggling analysis is quite nice in many ways. It has lots of good uh, effects, right? But I just can't appeal to that smuggling analysis because I can't do roll up movement, and this in 76 is absolutely crucially roll up movement, right? So, what I have to do instead is what you see in 77, and it's exactly the same method as uh, we saw for the modals and for VP shifting, right? What I need to do is I need to say, well, there needs to be some kind of auxiliary, right? That auxiliary needs to take the VP in its spec, okay? Um, so here I gave you an example with act and for, for these Dutch kind of cases where we recurse act. But actually, what we have in English is something not, too, not a million miles away from that. So what we have in English is we say, well, we've got some root B. That root can be labeled by the functional head to pass, which is some kind of voice head. Much like the act thing took two specifiers, one of which was a DP and one of which was a VP, it's exactly what's going to happen with this. So B, so passive is a sort of relational kind of predicate, rather than the modal, which is non-relational, the modal just adds on a mod modality relation, a modality specification, necessary or future or something. 
Okay, so what we do then is we say that we just recurse pass in the same way as we did with, uh, with at. Um, and then this thing here is going to be essentially the uh, agent in this case, right? So it's going to be um, Anson in this case. I'll fill out this bit in just a second. And then the external specifier is going to be the VP, or the thing that has the object in the verb, right? So this is like calling to this participial phrase. Okay. So but notice it's not moved anymore. Base generated as that specifier, we get bit billy. Okay. And then, just as Collins does, we can uh, take Lily and move her out and put her in spec T. Okay? So we got Lily. Now, here we have B, right? Now, in English, where are auxiliaries pronounced? Auxiliaries are pronounced high in English, right? So actually, for, for, for pass, for this span here, right, with pass in it, this is where we pronounce it in English. That's the distinction between main verbs and auxiliary verbs in English, right? So we pronounce this B up here. So we get Lily was, assuming this is past, bit, and that's not quite English yet, right? Lily was a bit Anson. No. Anson here is going to be the agent of this thing here. So it's really Lily was a bit by Anson. Okay. So the proposal I want, to, I want to defend, and I'll defend this, this, this is going to be now that we move on to PPs. The proposal I want to defend is one that says that basically we've got Anson will just go off to there. We've been treating Anson as a DP so far. So let's put actually a case head in front of it. Right? So what we have at, what we have at the top of all DPs is something that where the DP is case marked, right? It's the case marking part of the DP. And let's say that case head is in a spec head relationship, which it is, with this pass thing. Right? So that case head actually gets its value from pass. Now K pass is pronounced as by. So this is a, this goes back to how, we, how our fragments of functional projections work. So the final story for the passive there will be we call Lily, and then here this whole thing here is pronounced as was, right? B past, and then we've got bit. And go by and we've got Anson. Okay, so we've got Lily, so specifier for heads, the head was, Lily was, and then the next specifier down is bit, and then the next specifier down is by, and then Anson. Okay. So we get something that's structurally very, very similar to Collins' analysis, but it has two major advantages. In Collins' analysis, it's a bit of a mystery about why there's an auxiliary there. I mean, he sort of makes some noises about it, and he says, well, there's an auxiliary because voice B has to be selected by an auxiliary head, by a B phrase. But, I mean, to be honest, I mean, that's, doesn't, I mean, that's just a stipulation, right? In my system, for the same reasons we talked about already, B, right, in this auxiliary line here, because T is affixal, there needs to be an auxiliary in, this, in, in a passive. Okay. When is a T? There's no T that doesn't need to be an auxiliary, which is exactly what you get in reduced passives, right? A man kicked by a job. So in reduced relatives. The second major point that's in favor of this analysis as opposed to Collins is um, seen by examples like the following. So, um, so you can say something like this, right? The book was given and by, and then let's do some examples, by a book. A book was given by every girl to her mother, or a book was given by John and Fred to each other, 
or a book was given by the miser to himself at Christmas. Uh, what other examples do I have? Uh, that one. Okay? So you can see these examples show you that the, that the goal here right, is lower down than the vice is. Right? So every binds her, John and Fred binds reciprocal each other, uh, and the miser binds reflects it himself. I'm not going to say exactly where it is yet, we're going to come to that quite a lot later on. Um, and there's all sorts of complications about when you or reorder these. But all I want you to take away from this is that it's possible in English to show that, you know, this is the VP, right? And this thing here is a single unit with by every girl higher up than the goal. Now, in Collins' analysis, right, if you flip back again, if you, if you, oh, you need to flip, uh, look at 76 again, notice that in his analysis, the by phrase, has two parts, by and answer, right? And notice that they're not constituent to the exclusion of the rest of the verb phrase, right? So actually, if we put in Lily, uh, Lily, the book was given by Anson to Fred, right? To Fred is going to be inside that whole voice part layer, yeah? Everyone see that? Prediction, if we move the by phrase, right, so we WH move it, or we cleft it, or we do something like that, it should bring along all the rest of the VP with it. Prediction, as you can guess, is false, right? So have a look at the example in 78. Of course, what you say is, by whom was the book given to John, and not by whom to John was the book given. The cons is Analysis requires you to say that it's that, that if you're moving the by phrase, you move the rest of the VP. And that predicts 78B to be good, and 78B is crashingly terribly bad. Right? So my analysis, however, look, there is the by phrase. Whee! Right? So my analysis does not make that polygamy bad prediction. How does Anson get the agent agency? In 7, how does Anson what? I get that agent agency to roll. Okay, very good questions. Okay, so case is easy. Case of a noun phrase just means value the case. Right? So let's say that the topmost projection of n, once you get to the very end, is k. Right? And then in order to get, I mean, all case is, or noun phrase is, value k. So here k is getting its value by being the specifier pass. So it's very, I mean, it's a bit old-fashioned, it's like spec head valuation, but apparently that old-fashioned idea of sharing features when you're in a spec head configuration has in Chomsky 2013 got all funky again, right? So uh, and he's come around to that way of thinking, obviously, since reading the book. Uh, um, okay, so that's how it gets case. Theta rule, it's got theta rule just by the normal semantics, right? So, I haven't given you a semantics what the passive head here is, but it's going to be a semantics that is essentially similar to that agent semantics. Right? It's going to have a bit more in it, because it's going to have to say something about the stativity of the verb, and various other bits and pieces, but basically, that the semantics of this thing is going to be a modifier of an event here, which is going to add an agent to that event, okay, and it's going to say of that event that it's got passive characteristics, whatever they are, a spectrum of things. Right? So, so the semantics of this works just in the same way as the semantics of, say, it was John and Lily worked, right? Which is basically you take this thing as an event as a modifier of this of the event polluted by the VP. So the reason I say it's a different way of introducing arguments is that the Kratzerian way says, well, you take a little v, little v star, and you use event identification to bring the agent into the event. In this 
model here, what you end up doing is you, I mean, and semantically, this is just a set of events. It's a set of events of biting Lily. No, no. And semantically, this is going to also be a set of events. Right? It's a set of events that Anson is the agent of. Okay. So we've got a set of events here and a set of events here, and all we do is we use predicate modification to put them together. So in this case, I mean, it's, it's kind of weird, because it, it says that you know, this constituent here takes this as a modifier of it. So the verb phrase is a modifier of the by phrase, in a sense, right? But actually, it's kind of symmetric in semantics anyway, right? They're both like the E's, right? Use the vet, you know, use, it's just basically predicate modification to put this together. Yeah? Uh, okay, so the in connection to his questions, um, I'd like to uh, uh, to look at the internal structure of the node, the label O. So, uh, yeah. did really. So, yeah. what would be the motivation of the movement of energy, and uh, how can the lambda relation be can that case mm -hmm. in your system? Mm -hmm. And my other question is that you said that it's possible really with according to your big lambda functional system. Uh, your uh, label algorithm really is a D, right? And well, then it's now we're going to make a K. Hmm? I'll show you in a second. Okay. So it's a possible and language that determines that T can go that to T. Let me show you how this works and then see. see okay. So we've got O. Underneath this, we'll have bytes, the root, which goes to B. And we'll have Lily, now we'll make her a bit more complicated as well. We'll have Lily to the root, and it has some stuff. <coughs> so far we've been going to D, but I've just said now we go to K. Right. So this is how the case is going to work. Right. But notice that actually I've been a little bit sneaky here calling this O, because of course this isn't exactly the same as a normal finite DP. It's a participle, right? So, I mean, either this is a different kind of O, or actually, more, much more likely, there's another functional category above this, right, which uh, is not O, in a sense, right? right? It's not, so if you think about, normally O will get, so, so O doesn't, O provides the theta rule for the object, but not the case for the object. So here, there is, there is no case for the object, right? Because there's no V star here. So we've got whatever the participle head is, but I'm assuming that's not V star, because otherwise it would look like V star. So there's, so there's an unvalued case feature here, okay? And then, so what we need, do, need to do is we need to value it. Well, let's, if we move this to here for whatever reason, EPP or maybe case. Then we have k valued by t above Lily, and we know the k valued by t is nominative. Right? So the reason this gets nominative case is just in exactly the same way as anything gets nominative case. Uh, the reason this is bitten is because actually, the, you know, I put this as O, but it's clearly not O. Right? It needs to be a larger structure. Right? So it's some kind of problem, it might even be some kind of adjectival structure, but basically then the pronunciation of byte, pronunciation of this chunk is basically bit and then that's bitten, right? So the pronunciation of that is bitten. So we have lily, shoo, was, trace, bitten, by, and so on. So that's the way I'm assuming that the case system works inside of that. And that, of course, is exactly the same as the way the case systems normally would work, right? So, you know, I don't know whether that F there is some adjectivalization of the V or what it is. I mean, if it, you know, here's, here's something which kind of goes a little bit beyond where I was planning to go. If this ends up being actually a change in extended projection from V to A, right? So that participles are really A's of this. Then, I, I mean, if that's really true, 
then actually we could simplify, so I didn't do this in the book, but we could actually simplify the definition I gave of I complement of, yeah, I complement my specifier, okay? Because then we could all, I mean, it, it, it may be the case that we can just force it never to be true that we have this kind of configuration, I'm oh, sorry, this kind of configuration at all. There's one root and there's another root. Because it may be that that's, that, that actually, you know, this just never ever happens, right? If this never ever happens, then this would never be verbal, and that might also explain why this ends up being adjectival. Because you can't have, right? You can't have this verbal thing, and then this verbal thing, right? And then that would mean I wouldn't need to refer to roots at all, which would allow me to simplify the definition entirely. So a stronger, there is a stronger version of the theory than the one I present in my book, which I only thought about three or four months back, uh, which would simplify the theory in the book and would force this to be adjectival and not verbal, which seems maybe to be true. Right? That whenever you get these auxiliary structures, the specifier is never verbal. Now, that, that would be really <coughs> nice, but I, I mean, I haven't really, that's an area that I haven't really explored. Yeah. Does that answer your questions? Um, I might have forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> Are you asking why, why this moves to here? I don't know, but that rumor I can understand, and that is the case. But uh, really, right? Yeah. Uh, your lambda should give us the really uh, function, your label function. Uh, we will put the really, the label really, then it uh, is key, right? Yeah, so that, so that will be, so here we'll have k and t. So I'm wondering, any language, P, project to P directly. Ah, where you get P to T. Yeah, P, D, D goes to Oh, D goes to yes. T directly. Yeah. Is that conceptual or possible? Can you do? Yes, I mean, it would be, I mean, so, okay, I, I guess there's a separate question, which is what case theory is, right? I mean, so, if it's true that, that you always need to top off a DP with case, and you always need to value case, yes. and that's just part of UG, right? It's a separate part, but that's case theory effectively. Then you will never, I mean, then this, uh, any D going to some case assigner, T, yes. that's never going to work for you, right? Because you're always going to have to transit through K to get to T. So although this would be in lambda at the start, again, it would be ruled out because there's never going to be, I mean, the theory is never going to let you have that transition. Right? I mean, there are, you can think of, so this thing I'm talking about, the way I think about it is put everything in lambda and then use UG to filter this out of it during the acquisition process. So that would be that you, know, you never need to call upon analysis that takes you from D to T, because case theory, which is independent, rules it out, right? So, so you're never going to get evidence of D to T, so you'll never learn it. Ditto for, I don't know, say, uh, um, CL to N, right? It's going down, makes an objection. Phil slows rule that out, so you're never going to get evidence, so you're not going to have it. So that, that's the way I've been thinking about this because I'm kind of keen on this notion of uh, learning which involves variation. But you could instead take a much stronger viewpoint and just say, whenever you build this, you build it instantaneously, and you rule out all the things that UG immediately rules out for you. Right? So you compile the theory into a set of constraints on that. Right? I, haven't been, I mean, that's another way of thinking about it. That would be a much more traditional kind of view of thinking about it. But I kind of... I don't know. I mean, kids make mistakes, right? I mean, the question is, do kids make mistakes that violate UG? Actually, do you have any uh, tentative proposal about the UC, I mean, the kind of, uh, kind of uh, constraint to filtering out some, uh, some problematic cases? Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, most of what I've said so far 
is an attempt to filter out problematic cases. So, you know, in the business of an extended injection that goes, I don't know, C, T, uh, ask, V, root, right? That extended projection, right? I mean, that's rule values by the system, right? So, I mean, the system, that's this, uh, this filth thing will say, you can't do that because that's a structure which, you know, is not rooted and, and the structure doesn't map dominance to the relevant uh, universal extended projection. So this kind of structure is just ruled out by the system, right? Ditto the question that we just talked about, you know, if, if K always tops off an extended projection of a noun, and K always needs a value, right, then you're never going to have something, you're never going to have, you know, D as a specifier of T, because that would be the case license. So there are various kinds of Proposals for, I mean, you know, the very proposal of merge is UG as well, right? The fact that it's binary or unary is UG too. So, I mean, the whole system is, is an attempt to build in restrictive views of what the possible uh, gra individual grammars of human beings can have are. Yeah. Can you say a word about the relative ordering between uh, F and uh, K? Yeah. So that, I mean, that's a very good question. We'll, we'll come back to that question when we look at nominal phrases and prepositional phrases. Actually, if you define this, um, it will be lambda x, lambda e, agent x, e, something like that, right? Notice we try and put this in first, right? This is a set of events, right? So we try and put this in as a specifier of this, and we have a type clash immediately. Because this says, I want an individual, that's a set of events. Right? So we can't do that. So we're forced to go the other way around. However, there's a problem with, I mean, that's my solution. That solution works beautifully for land phrases. And we'll see how it is a bit. It's a bit problematic for verb phrases, though, because actually, we do have a way of doing lambda x, lambda e stuff, and lambda e stuff together, and that's event composition. Right, event, Kratzer's event identification. So actually, you know, although the solution I just gave you works very neatly for nine phrases where there is no event composition, it's actually somewhat problematic in this case. So it allows them both, both to arrive. So my solution to that, again, it's not in the book, uh, but my solution to that would be get rid of little v star as, as you know. So always introduce agents in this way, right, with an act type of predicate, always in two like that, and then raise, in English, raise that into the inspect TP. So that would mean that, uh, even, I thought about putting this in the book, but even I was like, that's too much. So, so the proposal would be that all active phrases, all active sentences are underlyingly passive, would be the story. And I thought that was a bit too much. <laughs> but I, I kind of like it, right? I sort of think that, I mean, it, gets, it allows you to get rid of event identification entirely, right? Uh, and if you get rid of event identification, it solves this problem, because you can't have event identification, right? And there's actually no pro I mean, there's no general problem with it, right? I mean, so you just sort of say that, basically, you have two versions of this. One of which case assigns, one of which doesn't. The one that doesn't case assign, you move this up there. Right? The one that does case assign, you don't. You have to say something about what this F is and its relationship to this. But, you know, I mean, it's actually fairly straightforward to do. Well, when it's say, fairly straightforward. Conceptually, it's fairly straightforward. Technically, it means we're on But yes, I mean, there, there is that issue with this. Yeah. So, uh, I'm a bit worried about the te technical um, points in, in moving Lily out. Of T. Uh -huh. because, um, if we adopt the event identification, we have to assume that O is kind of a modifier of the past, right? Uh, yeah, well, let's call it F, right? Since it's the. Uh, okay, yeah. so it doesn't matter. Yeah. So, this, so this is like a modifier of this. Yeah. They are modifiers of each other. So which means that it's kind of for adjunct. Ah. So we have to move something out of adjunct. 
So, I mean, that's not, I mean, that's a very good point, but I, it's not what I'm assuming. I'm not assuming that predicate modification is something which is exactly mapping onto whatever adjuncts are in syntax, right? So this is really an outer specifier whose semantics is, is the modif is, I mean, the relationship between this is the modification relationship, sure, but syntactically it's just a specifier, right? So, I mean, I mean, because that's the definition. Syntactically, it's an I specifier because that complement relationship. These are two different root structures. That's an I specifier, right? And then, sorry, then we have to say there is kind of special specifier here because not all the specifiers are are modifiers in your system, right? Right. There's. I mean, if you look at the definition the way the semantics works, it just said. So the semantics that I have is what's known as type driven. Mm -hmm. So there's this uh, very nice paper a long, long time ago by. You and Klein and Ivan Sad called type driven translation. And uh, what they show in that paper, it's what we all do all the time now, is uh, they say, here's the syntax. Let's just say that whatever semantic relationship can hold between the two elements that are being put together in the syntax is dependent upon the meaning of those two elements. Right? So if one's a function and one is an argument, you know, one is of type ET and one is of type E, you apply function application. If one is of type ET, T, e, T, e, T, and the other is of type uh, E, um, I think. Yeah, if one is of type ET to T, and the other is of type ET, you apply functional application. Or you can apply type raising to the first one, raise up higher, take the second one as a complement. If you have two things that are, that, so this is what you, what we were talking about earlier on uh, in the talk before the break. If you have something which uh, essentially allows functional composition, you do functional composition. So you may have four maybe basic ways of doing semantics. Application, composition, modification, identification, like Higginbotham 1995, and you apply whichever one suits. So here, this is a specified relationship that we are applying functional application. Here, this is a specified relationship that we're applying predicate modification. So the, the nature of the semantics is driven by the types of the elements that enter into that semantic and by the fact that they are syntactically composed of each other. So there is no issue about specifiers having only one way of composing. In fact, since this system, well, you saw the semantics are defined, right? The semantics just says, apply whatever semantic relationship works to you know, first of all, complement, and secondly, specify. Yeah. So there is an interesting question about adjuncts, though. Mm -hmm. And there's an interesting question about you know, moving from inside specify. Right? So I actually think that you can move from inside specify, but you can probably only move from the edge of specifiers. Right? So you need to get this to the edge, and then you're fine. Right? So, uh, but what you couldn't do, for example, is take bitten or some lower bit, we need that bit in the specifier. Because then, of course, that would, well, if we need to move through the edge, then that would immediately create a roll-up structure. So we wouldn't be able to do that. So if you, have, if you can only move through the edge of specifiers, that is, they're, they're uniformly phasal in some sense, then you predict that you can never roll up out of the specifier. Right? Which I think is easy. Cool. Is that telling you? <laughs> Oh, it is time up. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. All right. So thank you very much. So we've, we've done the system, and so now tomorrow I'll do the lectures that we should have done today. Okay. We're only we're only an entire day behind. So I think that's okay. Right. All right. Thank you.